Let's bow our heads together. God in heaven, we so thank you for this Advent season, for all that Christmas means to us because of what came so long ago, Christ to this world, Emmanuel, God with us. Lord, we pray today for those who are in any kind of trouble in this world or any special need. We ask, Lord, that again you reach from heaven and meet that need and bring them through. Lord, we pray that the message will be clear today and that you will speak through your scripture to us in an unmistakable way that we might respond and give our all to you. Through Christ we pray. Amen. We're talking during this Advent season on the subject, All I Want for Christmas Is. And last week we talked about hope, hope for our world. Today, we talk about peace. Jerry lit the candle of peace, and that is our subject. So take your Bible and turn to the book of Romans. Not usually a Christmas text, but I believe it is. And you'll look far and wide to find a passage that has more gospel in it than Romans chapter 5, the first 11 verses. The words are on the screen, but if you have your own Bible, I want you to use it and turn to this text. Verse 1, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. That was our subject last week. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies... We were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. God's word for God's people this day. Wilmer was living a quiet life on a beautiful a farm in Manassas, Virginia, not very far from here. And uh, he was there with his family, a beautiful homestead. He was a grocer in Manassas. Then the Civil War came. And uh, the first battle of the Civil War was fought uh, near that farm. In fact, it got onto his farm and a stray artillery shell crashed through his house and even fell into a pot of stew on the stove. That was in 1861. In 1862, the second battle of Bull Run, or Manassas, again touched his house, touched his family. If you had asked Wilmer what he wanted for Christmas, no doubt he would say, I'd like a little peace. And that ought to be on everybody's list this Christmas. Peace. Peace internationally, peace in our country, peace in our families, and peace in our hearts. We live in a world racked by conflict, and so we all long for peace. Peace has been defined as serenity and the absence of hostility, war being over. Peace is also a feeling. I would like just a little peace and quiet, my mother used to say. That song in 1972 by the Eagles, I get a 
peaceful, easy feeling. That's what all of us want. But Plato said only the dead have seen the end of war. War has been a part of our human condition since the very beginning and remains so. Patrick Henry in Williamsburg, Virginia said, Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. He was quoting Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 14. He ended it by saying, give me liberty or give me death. There is a time for war, Ecclesiastes says, and a time for peace. We are longing for that time of peace to come. The real problem, though, is not an international problem or even a national problem that can be solved by leaders. The real problem is the human heart. Thomas Merton said, we aren't at peace with others because we aren't at peace with ourselves. And we're not at peace with ourselves because we're not at peace with God. When you have peace with God, then you can have peace in your heart. And then peace with others is possible. But it starts in the heart. Adam and Eve, in the first couple of chapters of our Bible, were living in a place of perfect peace. And they walk with God and they talk with God and it was beautiful. But in chapter 3, the serpent came and temptation was there and they succumbed to that temptation and they went on the run. They were running and hiding from God and we're doing it still. We're hiding from God. The problem is within ourselves. James chapter 4, James chapter 4 verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? And Romans chapter 5 verse 10, we just read it. While we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him. We've got a conflict going with God from our hearts, we're on the run. G.K. Chesterton saw this question in a newspaper. The question was, what's wrong with the world? He took up pen and paper and answered the question, Dear sir, what is wrong with this world? I am. And that's what's wrong with our world. You and I, we're wrong. It, the problem starts with us. But here's the good news. It's the good news of Christmas. Peace is possible. Peace in the Old Testament is the word shalom, and it means wholeness, well-being. When you wish somebody shalom, you're wishing them wholeness. Peace is possible. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 says that when this Messiah comes, he will be known as the Prince of Peace. And when the angels announced the birth of Jesus, they said, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. So it's possible. But now if the real problem is you and me, that's where peace must first come. And our text speaks to that this morning. First of all, it is possible for us to have peace with God Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. Some translations say, let us have peace. But no, this text has it correctly. We already have the peace. We have peace with God. Since we have been justified, that word justified means to be declared righteous. God looks at us through the picture grid of Jesus and he declares that we are righteous. We have peace with God right now. We receive that peace by faith. Faith, that's the intellectual acknowledgement of the reality of Jesus. It's a mental thing, but then it comes to the heart. We believe, we trust, and we rely on we receive this by faith. It is his gift of grace. Grace means unmerited favor. It's his gift. The first Christmas present to you and to me was salvation through Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works. And this gift 
is purchased by his blood. Look at verse 8 if you're still in Romans 5. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? This gift was purchased by his blood. Now people don't want to hear about blood at Christmas time. That's one reason uh, Christmas is so much more popular than Easter is. Easter, if you, really, if you think about it, Easter is a much more significant holy day for us. But the world prefers Christmas because there's no blood at Christmas time. There's no violence. There's no death. There's a beautiful little baby. And everybody loves babies. But we've got to let Jesus grow up. When you see the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger, swaddling clothes were also used for grave clothes when somebody died. And this baby is going to grow up and he's going to die for you and for me. He will shed his blood so that we might be saved. We have this justification right now. If you've ever said yes to Christ, if you've ever given him your life, he lives in you and you have your salvation. The most famous battle of the War of 1812 was fought in January of 1815. It was the Battle of New Orleans. It made Andrew Jackson a national hero and later he became president. The Battle of New Orleans, however, was fought after the war had actually ended. Eighteen days before the Battle of New Orleans, The Treaty of Ghent was signed. The war was over. But they didn't have instant communication in those days. So word did not reach the United States. And Jackson went ahead and fought that battle. We're fighting battles today. We're running from God today needlessly. Because the war is over. Christ has died and given us eternal life. We've been reconciled. We've been brought back into the presence of God. He accepts us. He accepts you regardless of what you've done in your life as you've trusted in him. We have peace with God. But we have something else. We have the peace of God. The peace of God. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 tells us not to worry about anything but to pray about everything. And then the scripture says this. And the peace of God, of God, which passes all understanding shall keep our guard, our hearts, and our minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God. That's what we can have. With this peace of God, we have access to his throne. It is possible for you right now to go into the very presence of God for yourself. I'm happy to to lead you there. I'm, I'm happy to pray for you. But you don't need me to do that. You can go right into the throne room of God for yourself. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need, Hebrews chapter 4 says. You can walk right in. You have an open invitation to come into the presence of God. I hope you're taking advantage of that and that you're using that. That comes with the peace of God. We can rejoice. Our text here says we can rejoice even in suffering. Your peace is not dependent on circumstances. They change. Who of us thought when we began this year how this year would turn out? I remember I preached in January of 2020. I I talked about vision for the future and what a great year it was going to be and what we were going to do. And we had no idea then what was headed our way. Did we lose our peace, the peace of God? Absolutely not. We still have that. It never leaves us. We can rejoice even in suffering because we know God is at work. He's not lost control. And through this suffering, he is producing in us perseverance and character and hope and peace. 
And now we're looking for many more blessings. Since we now have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved? Jack Taylor years ago wrote a book entitled Much More. And he was reminding us that in Christ, the blessings just keep on coming, producing peace in our lives. So there is peace. It's available to us. Now here's what I want you to leave with today. You and I, as recipients of his salvation, justification, and peace, we are now called to be peacemakers. This is our responsibility as believers. Elie Wiesel, when he accepted the Nobel Peace Prize in 1986, said, Peace is our gift to each other. I have it, so I need to share it with you. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Romans 12 verse 18 puts a little caveat on it. It says, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live at peace with all people. Sometimes peace isn't possible. You want it with that person. You want it in that relationship. You want it in your community, but it's not totally up to you. It takes two or three or more to make that happen. But as much as it depends on you, don't be part of the problem. Be part of the answer. Be a peacemaker. I quoted Philippians a little while ago. I want to go back there for a moment. If you have a Bible, turn to Philippians chapter 4. That's the passage that talks about the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard our hearts. Chapter 4 begins this way. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy, my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. And then he references a problem between two women in the church there. There was no peace I plead with Theodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. These ladies had gotten crosswise with each other, and we don't know the issue, but the readers of this original letter knew exactly what Paul was referring to. They were at odds. So Paul says, I plead with both of them to get together, to get on the same page, the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion... Help these women. So you've got two people in conflict. Paul says to somebody else, now would you please help them? They're unable to get it resolved themselves. Here's what I want you to see though. I plead with Syntyche and Yodia to be of the same mind. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. I I call verse 3 a gem statement, G-E-M, like a diamond, a gem statement. In dealing with folk with whom there's conflict, always keep the gem statement front and center. You see what he's pointing out, the conflict. And these women need to be straightened out, but he does it gently. He reminds this companion, this church, that these women are good women. They were his companions in the gospel. They worked alongside of him, but something has come about. This gem statement focuses on the positive. And when you have to talk to somebody, a very difficult conversation... And you have to do it. Something's wrong. You've got to address it. You don't sweep it under the rug. But always look for the gem statement that overrides everything. For example, I know we've got this problem between you and me. But I want you to know I still love and respect you. And I still thank God for your life and and the, the blessing you have been to me. You see, that's the gem statement. And when you put the emphasis there, the person is better able to hear the harsher thing you need to say. We're called to be peacemakers. Look where there's conflict and see what you can do to help. 
Wilmer McLean just couldn't stay in Manassas. It was too dangerous for his family. So he looked for a quiet place far from the battle where he could have some peace. So he found a little village south of Richmond called Appomattox. And he moved his family there. In April of 1865, Lee met Grant and surrendered the Confederate forces. And the war was over. And so it's true to say that the Civil War began in Wilmer McLean's front yard and ended in his parlor. And you can visit it today. A few years after the war, McLean moved with his family to Alexandria, Virginia. And this is where he died in 1882. He's buried in the cemetery at St. Paul's Church. War may have begun, but you can end it. You can be present by receiving Christ, by trusting in Him, and then spreading that peace to others. Would you pray with me, please, everyone? In a moment, we're going to sing. I'm going to stand at the front of the aisle. If you today would give your heart to Christ or... Trust Him maybe for the very first time. If you'd like to join our church and you're in the room, come to the front where I am and tell me so. If you're at home watching, you can bow your head and ask Christ to be your Savior and Lord and give you what you most want, and that is peace. Lord, thank you for the gospel of Christmas. Thank you for all that you've given us, but especially a right relationship with you. So I pray for anyone who needs that today, that it will be theirs by faith. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Let's stand and we sing.